Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Geopolitical Futures podcast. I'm your host, Cole Altum. Joining me today is Jacob Shapiro, our Director of Analysis. Hello, Jacob. Hello, Cole. Cole is our is our managing editor. He forgot to identify his position. Oh, I didn't forget. I'm just uh, not quite as uh, pre- pretentious as that. But um, but I, th- I thank you. I thank you for saving me the trouble. Um, remember, you can always find us at geopoliticalfutures.com. Uh, buy a subscription if you're so inclined. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Jacob, I don't know. Is it possible to get a uh, get a hangover from boredom? Because I think I kind of have that today after last night's Super Bowl, uh, which was a oh, god awful contest. Yeah, it was really really bad. Um, it's a it's a it's a big football game, uh, it, but it was really really bad. Um, it was bad enough to make some of those stupid Bud Light commercials actually like kind of appealing. Uh, it was bad enough to make Maroon Five kind of exciting. It was just really really bad. I turned it off. It was it was just awful. Yes, there certainly is a hangover from boredom. It it probably is at least a little bit similar to the way I felt after I was forced to read The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, which Hemingway, great author, love a lot of his books, love a lot of his short stories, but I never understood why The Old Man in the Sea is the one that they they assign to everyone in school, you know? Well, I think it it won the 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 the, the big prize. I think uh I think he got kind of McMurtry. He'd been writing a lot of really really good books and that was the one that finally noted uh, netted him the the Nobel. Um, which I don't really understand, but that happens a lot, right? The Road by Cormac McCarthy is one of Cormac McCarthy's worst books. It's great, but it's one of his worst books. And you know that one got the the Pulitzer, I think, um, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, none of it really ever does. But then, then again, uh, Cormac McCarthy fans and Ernest Hemingway fans are nowhere nearly as insufferable as most Patriot fans, in my experience. Um, so with 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 that shade thrown uh let's uh let's get into the to the week ahead what do you say let's do it you know i'm i'm feeling a little bit nervous because we recorded an entire hour long podcast with a special guest last week and unfortunately the recording software that we were using it just flat out broke so hopefully hopefully we'll have our conversation about the week ahead and this will actually reach the listeners yeah that's infuriating it is infuriating when that happens especially if it's actually good because then it was good and then we're gonna we're gonna get the guest back and we're gonna do it the right way but just so listeners are wondering if if you wonder why you didn't hear from us last week it was the dog ate our homework right we don't know how to operate the internet um it wasn't our fault by the way it was the software we used we did nothing we did nothing wrong no it's never our fault never never not once um speaking of not our fault the united states is intervening in venezuela right that was quite a segue Thank you very much. I wanted to want to really hammer that point home. Not militarily intervening, not yet. That has not happened. Um, I think when people say intervention, they tend to nec- they implicitly mean uh, military. That is not the case. Um, but politically and economically, you know, the United States is doing all that it can to affect regime change there. Um, so, do you want to talk a little bit about that? We haven't actually addressed Venezuela on the podcast yet. So, you want to give a little primer on that before we kind of delve into what we're looking at? Yeah. Look, I mean, we. We covered in the 2019 annual forecast, which if if y'all haven't taken a a read of that, I would highly suggest going at it. It's looking pretty good this year so far. But we talked in the the annual forecast about how the United States was probably going to be a lot more aggressive about enforcing and policing what is the Monroe Doctrine, which is essentially this idea that it it was originally the idea that there would be no European intervention in North and South America. Now it has sort of grown to the point where there should be no outside intervention whatsoever uh, from the entire world, not just from European powers, China being, of course, the power that everyone is thinking about. But we said in the forecast that we expected that that to happen. I confess that we did not have Venezuela at the front of our minds for that. I, I think we were actually looking at a few other situations, especially in Central America and related to you know, refugees coming up into Mexico and through the United States. But Venezuela certain, certainly ties in there. And the current administration has decided that this is enough of a national security interest for the United States that it needs to move on on Venezuela after, I mean, it's been kind of years now of, of chest beating in the U.S. administration without doing much. Yeah, we've been covering this for a very long time, as have a lot of other people. Um, and it, it does kind of seem like it's coming to a head right now at long last, although we've a lot of people have said that before. But what hasn't happened before that that I can remember was a vice president calling um, the person who would eventually declare himself president 
in Venezuela and telling him he had the full support of the United States, um, in addition to even new new sanctions um, levied against the oil co- the national oil company PDVSA. So interesting times. Yeah, it it is interesting times. And I mean, Venezuela has been one of those things that has been hard to gauge because the situation has been deteriorating there for so long. I mean, just if you had economic crisis in the United States at the level that the Venezuelans have been experiencing economic crisis for the past, let's call it five years, I mean, it would basically be the purge, the movie out there, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like thousand percent inflation. There are just like there are things that are not available on the stores, or excuse me, not available on the shelves of stores. Currency does isn't worth very much at all. People are having a hard time just getting like basic foodstuffs. Uh, it's just like it's it's not good, and they're they're enduring an awful lot. So it's not it's perfectly understandable why they would be upset with the administration, especially you go back to the elections a couple years ago, which were widely regarded as you know fraudulent maduro hugo chavez's successor won by a very narrow margin and they had to uh invoke some constitutional uh trickery to actually you know make it make it stick you understand where they're coming from but you could also understand you know some some trepidation in venezuela and outside venezuela about the prospect of the united states you know intervening in another government transition we have a kind of a checkered history about that to say the least yeah we do, and and this is one of the most difficult points because you know, there are different levels of how much a society can take depending on the society. Like, not all societies can take the same level of economic harm or political t- deterioration and react the same way. And what the United States is doing here is it is betting that it has its finger on the pulse of the Venezuelan people and that the Venezuelan people have turned against the Maduro government. Now, if you are looking on Twitter, if you're watching social media, if you're reading what a lot of Western media sources are trying to project here, yes, you see many tens of thousands of people in the streets in Venezuela. At the same time, the Venezuelan military hasn't buckled yet. So the Venezuelan military is still supporting this particular regime. And, you know, it, it's a risk to to say that, that you know what the Venezuelan, the majority of the Venezuelan people want, and that the legitimate leader of this country should be the person that the United States picks. One of the things that the United States always seems to do in this situation is that the United States, especially when it is articulating its foreign policy, it has a tough time articulating it in a way that doesn't give the United States the moral high ground. Right. So there are a number of strategic reasons that we can go through to talk about why the United States has an interest in Venezuela. Number one, you've got Russia and China. They've been circling really since Chavez to try and develop more influence there, get some kind of counterbalance to what the U.S. is doing either in Eastern Europe when you're at Russia or the South China Sea if you're China. Um, in, In recent years, I mean, we're getting to millions of refugees, millions of Venezuelans who are spilling over the borders into Colombia, into Brazil. That can eventually destabilize those countries there. And a lot of those countries are U.S. allies, especially Brazil now under this new president wants to be a newfound U.S. ally. They've got these Venezuelans spilling over the border. You've got Cuba has been involved in Venezuela for a long time. And a lot of the ruling elite, all that other stuff is tied in there to say nothing of you know Venezuela giving home to drug traffickers or the way that drug trafficking money goes in. You, know, you can go through the list of strategic interests that the United States might have in Venezuela. And yet when you listen to what the United States government says is its policy in Venezuela, it's about returning democracy, returning Venezuelan democracy to the people of Venezuela, that the United States is going to be continuing to use its economic and political influence to create a situation in Venezuela that allows that return to Venezuelan democracy. Uh, There are those who think that pursuing a particular kind of moral or political end is a part of the U.S. national interest. Uh, if you're more of the unilateral hawkish tendency, that's a neoconservative. If you're more of the liberal internationalist interventionist, you're sort of in the mold of, of you know, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt built and what the Clinton administration, I think, is probably the best example for. But my point there is just that this is yet another situation where there are a number of interests the United States could articulate that it wants to pursue in Venezuela and yet the way the united states is justifying it is saying well the venezuelan people don't recognize this government and it is a moral issue that the united states must intervene to give back the venezuelan democracy to the venezuelan people and i think when you get that disjuncture between interest and between policy 
That's where you start to get things like mission creep. That's where I, I don't want it, to, it's too overblown to compare it to a rock because it's not nearly the same level of commitment. But that same kind of thing where if you cannot define very clearly what you're doing, it becomes very hard to actually implement the change that you want to see. Well, and the proof there and what you're talking about too is uh, the person that the administration has chosen to kind of spearhead those efforts, at, which is, uh, or who is Elliot Abrams. And he has a a pretty consistent you know, track record of, of being a proponent of intervention throughout uh, Latin America um, in his past. Um, so there's going to be a lot to watch out for. You know, we're, we're watching for, you know, any kind of military defections. There, there are some, but none high level um, yet to really move that needle. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, there aren't. And, you know, for me, the, and we covered this in this morning's memo, if, if any of you all are subscribers and you look at our daily update on what's going on in the world, but now, the United States said over the weekend that it wanted to dispatch humanitarian aid to Venezuela, but they can't even send it to anyone inside of Venezuela because there's no one inside of Venezuela that the United States trusts enough to get the humanitarian aid or whatever it is to. All this aid is going to Colombia, to Brazil, to some unnamed Caribbean island until such time that the United States and the government or the representative of the Venezuelan people that it's recognizing can actually get on the ground and accept delivery of this humanitarian aid. So the United States is using just about every tool it has in its toolkit to try and affect regime change in Venezuela. But at the same time, the people who control the monopoly of violence on the state in Venezuela, they're still in charge. They haven't buckled yet. And maybe the United States can use its influence in order to do so but even then, you're on this slippery slope where, you know, in 10 years' time, Venezuela is, even if everything goes perfectly, even if you have a perfect liberal democracy spread up in Venezuela and everything is fine, it's going to take decades for that economy to recover. It's going to take decades for that political process to intervene. And in 10 years' time, if the United States is seen as a power that intervened in the internal affairs of Venezuela to create an inorganic situation under the guise of you know, morally knowing what was ethically right for all Venezuelans. I mean, that's exactly the type of situation where the U.S. gets in trouble. And, and again, it, it comes from a place, I think, with the U.S. of mostly, I don't want to call it good intentions, but just the U.S. electorate is allergic to the idea of the United States behaving as an empire or even just behaving in ways that it sees as amoral or strictly strategic. So the US government has to sell it to them in a particular kind of way. Uh, and I think that, you know, the United States, it would do better if it would just say what it was up to rather than trying to dress it up as this whole you know, democratic sham. Well, dressing it up as such is also sort of a, uh, a hallmark of imperial foreign policy. But we, sh we should probably leave it at that and, and, and move on. You've also got a lot going on um, over in the UK right now. Um, there, we're, we're we're seeing some some attacks by the IRA. Um, coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally, uh, as the Brexit deadline approaches. Now, the, the the Brexit has a lot of implications for for what some of the borders might be, and it might reset those borders. And that's why I think what everybody's confused about. Can you kind of walk me through that? Yeah, I mean, speaking of imperialism, right? right. Um, <laughs> Look, I, I disagree with you a little bit in the sense that there is something new going on. I think that a lot of people thought that once you had the Good Friday Agreement, that these things just went away, and they haven't gone away. There are still paramilitary groups on the ground. A lot of them have gone into things like organized crime and drug trade and things of that nature. But if you look by any metric, if you look at shootings or if you look at bombings or if you look at murders, you look at paramilitary activity, none of this stuff has gone away in Northern Ireland. And I think the general fear here is that as, as you get closer to some kind of decision point as relates to Brexit, whether it's a deal or not a deal, is that going to create a situation where what is kind of a low level and it's been under control for, let's call it for the last 15 years relatively, is that situation that has been held relatively in check going to explode? And unfortunately, there are a lot of negative indicators. And the indicators are not that there has been an uptick in, in violence. There actually hasn't been. It's just that people are actually noticing that this stuff still happens in Northern Ireland. But Northern Ireland hasn't had its own government in something like over a year and a half now. And the British government doesn't want to be in there because that's exactly the type of mess that creates problems with it. You've got you know nationalist parties in Ireland talking openly about, well, is this the time for Irish unification now? 
and that question being asked openly because they don't want to have to deal with the fallout of what if there is a hard Brexit? What if there is some kind of need to put a border in place? So th this for me is the real question around Brexit. I don't really care much for the negotiations and the nonstop soap opera uh, about you know, this negotiation and Juncker said that and May said this and vote of no confidence, but she's still in you. Know, all that kind of stuff is peripheral for me. That's about the United Kingdom and European Union figuring out their future relationship. And I think that both sides have an interest to make that work together. It's much harder to, to untie the knot that is Northern Ireland. Well, right. I mean, these, these things are interesting because they do have the potential, however remote it might be, to physically redraw borders. And that's a big deal. I mean, I don't I think the UK is going to stay intact, don't get me wrong, but this does raise the possibility that the United Kingdom might not be the United Kingdom we know today. Again, just even that possibility, we kind of have to entertain a little bit, right? Well, I'd take it one step further. We have to entertain that, that the entire strategic balance of both the European continent and its relationship with Great Britain is changing. Because for as long as Great Britain has been in the European Union, which is what, 19, early 1970s, I think it's 1972, you've basically had Great Britain, even though it's, you know, it's been a little bit at a distance, it didn't want to take the euro, it, it has maintained some levels of independence. But overall, you had Great Britain pretty well locked in to a system that also included France, that also included Germany, that you know, after the Soviet Union fell, integrated a large number of European states. Uh, the question of Ireland for Great Britain didn't really matter at that point because Ireland was part of that system too. If you have Great Britain withdrawing from the European Union, then suddenly Ireland becomes an open question because you cannot just expect that in perpetuity, Ireland is just going to be neutral or even in a friendly arrangement toward you. If you're thinking just pure British geopolitics, Ireland is your biggest vulnerability. Ireland is the one that is right there that can block access to sea. You know, all these other sorts of things. And if you're a British strategic planner or a policymaker, you can't plan with what you hope to happen. You can't plan with the idea that, yeah, everything's going to be okay. We'll all figure it out. You have to plan with the idea that, well, the relationship with Ireland now is a little bit more suspect. And the ironic thing here is that you know, for as long as Great Britain and Ireland were part of the European Union together, there really was no benefit for the United Kingdom to keep a hold on Northern Ireland. There are all sorts of obsolete reasons, just on a strategic basis, to continue you know, holding on to Northern Ireland. But as long as uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland were part of the same entity, which I'm saying is the European Union, the United Kingdom didn't really have to think about Ireland as a potential threat, even though I'm, I'm not saying that Ireland is a potential threat to the United Kingdom right now. I'm just saying that once you're no longer in the same block as Ireland and you're the United Kingdom, Suddenly, Northern Ireland is a pretty important position. Suddenly, Northern Ireland is a way to neutralize any potential threat that might come from Ireland or that anybody on the European continent wants to use against, wants to use Ireland against you for. Again, it's remote, but the, if the United Kingdom, you know, if those borders do change and its relationships to these, to its former constituent members does change, it, it creates those faraway possibilities that you just laid out is kind of the point. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, in Scotland, they've already been talking about a second referendum, a uh, second independence referendum. And there is some polling to suggest that, you know, certainly if you get a harder Brexit than most, let's say you get a hard, like we're expecting a deal between the United Kingdom and between the European Union. Let's say we're wrong. And let's say that you do get some kind of hard Brexit. There's some polling to suggest that, you know, sentiment in Scotland would turn very much pro-independence, very much pro-EU. Then it would become a question of what the EU is going to do. You get into a lot of hypothetical situations, right? But if you assume for a minute that you get a hard Brexit, and, you know, even though I think it's not going to happen that way, certainly a possibility, especially considering everything that's going on right now. Yeah, that could transform things very quickly. That That's the thing. When you get these kind of changes, when you have as much pressure as there is, sort of height lurking beneath the surface in Northern Ireland, or when you get the kind of major strategic sh shift that a hard Brexit would be for a country like Scotland, these things can happen very quickly. These, you know, changes in borders or changes in sovereignty and independent status, these are not things that build slowly over a period of years or decades. Often you go a long period of time with a relative period of stability. Over time, the interests that actually created whatever political arrangement was there in the first place start to fray or start to atrophy a little bit, and they're not quite as strong. And then, boom, something happens, and then everything changes, and there's a complete and total shift in the entire situation. So I'm not saying the UK is going to break apart, but again, 
if you are a if you're sitting in Great Britain, if you're thinking about the future of Great Britain, it's much, much, much less certain than it was even five years ago. What's the uh, what's the newest country we have here in this in this earth? Is it South Sudan? The newest country that we have. Um, I guess that depends who's recognizing what, right? I want to say South Sudan is the most recent country. Correct me if I'm wrong. But if that's the case, I mean, you know, the Sudans are not the United Kingdom. Don't get me wrong. Uh, But that was several years ago, and it's been unstable literally the entire time. It's been civil war after civil war after internal strife, which is just to your point that these things, you know, partition doesn't doesn't resolve differences. And sometimes it just aggravates them. I mean, sometimes it can. When? That's a, um, that's, that's a, that's a genuine okay. question. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I can't think of a single time just off the top that that partition was necessarily a good thing. You know, East, West Germany, North, South Korea, North and the Confederacy and the Union. Um, those are three of probably one billion examples out there, but I can't think of any. Well, I could spin some of I, you could spin some of those as positive. I, top of my head is India, Pakistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. North South Vietnam's a bad one, to your point. Yeah, fair enough. But you know, but even with Kashmir, that's I guess, I guess I guess you could probably say it did ameliorate tensions, but it's not like they have gone away, right? That's still that's still a really hot button issue. Sure, you can think of the collapse of the Soviet Union as one big partition, in some ways. Well, since we brought up India, India, Pakistan, let's stay in South Asia for just a second. Um, let's talk a little bit about Afghanistan. I think we have some time. Um, nothing, nothing dramatic has necessarily happened there, um, other than reports after report that that we're starting to see some movement toward a kind of a negotiated settlement between uh, the United States and the powers that be in Afghanistan and the Taliban. That's kind of a win for our forecast. Uh, we're probably going to publish something on it later on this week. I just kind of wanted to pick your brain about that real quick, if you had the time. So it's it's a particularly sweet forecast for me because you know I was going around in November and December and giving a sneak peek of our forecast to different conferences and different audiences. And one of the things I would talk about was that we were expecting a U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, this year in the calendar year 2019. I think it's looking like it's probably not going to be a full withdrawal in 2019. It'll probably bleed into 2020, but it looks like the U.S. government really does want to get out and that there are very serious negotiations happening with the Taliban in order to extricate the United States, not just the United States, but all foreign troops from the country. And look, I, it's not like we had any top secret information here. What we just had was you had the combination of the United States is overstretched. It has a lot of other different priorities that are not Afghanistan. This this Trump administration has identified Iran as a major problem that it wants to tackle. North Korea, China, Venezuela, we talked about earlier in the podcast. You can't do all those things and still continue committing as many resources, both you know, economic, political, and military to a conflict that really isn't going where going anywhere for the United States. So the United States has a lot of reason to get out of Afghanistan, and really the only thing keeping it there at this point is inertia. I mean, the thing that and this this goes back to the point that we began with, right? Part of the reason that Afghanistan went bad for the United States and Iraq went bad for the United States later on was because again, there was a really bad definition of what the goal was. If the goal had just been articulated as go into Afghanistan, make sure that Afghanistan cannot be used as a platform for any jihadist organization to launch attacks, terrorist attacks against the United States. That is a much different mandate than transform Afghanistan into a liberal democracy, right? And the United States went in thinking that it could reshape Afghanistan in its interests. Not only that, but thinking that it had to reshape Afghanistan in its own interests in order to prevent something like Al-Qaeda or any of these other groups from going back. If the United States had just gone in and said, look, the goal here is to completely obliterate Al-Qaeda. Any any actor that stands in the way of the United States obliterating, obliterating Al-Qaeda will be obliterated along with it. That, that's actually a mission that the United States military could have undertaken, right? The problem was that the United States couldn't just say that. It had to also go in and say, okay, we're going to return democracy to the to Afghanistan, to the Afghan people. And look, Afghanistan is such a fractured, broken society that has been at war with itself and has been a you know 
I don't want to say a playground because that makes light of it, but has been a competition ground between major powers now going back, you know, at least to the sixties and well before then, um, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not a place that is going to be ready for the, for the creation of a, of a liberal democracy. So, you know, the way the United States defined its goals in Afghanistan, it failed and it, it lost the war, but in terms of satisfying its interest, there's no Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. They can't use Al, Al Qaeda can't use Afghanistan as a base and hasn't been able to in over a decade. So from that point of view, um, you know, what the United States needed to get out of that intervention it did. Well, I think uh I think that's about time to wrap up. Do you uh do you have anything else you want to go over before we go? Just that I'm really excited to to read through Germany's new industrial strategy plan 2030. Should be a, should be a fun read. Comes out comes out on Tuesday, which that sounds fascinating. Look, anytime the German government says it's going to make a hairpin turn and implement a major strategy that's going to you know, defend the national interest and completely transform German manufacturing and the German economy, I listen. They have a pretty pretty uh, impressive track record. Well, maybe that will be the uh, the the focus of a future podcast, but uh, we'll wrap this one up now. Uh, Jacob, thank you for taking the time. L dear listeners, thank you for taking the time as well. Um, if you're interested in subscribing but don't want to pay up the money, we have a free list you can join and kind of sample some of our wares that way. And if you are so inclined to subscribe, uh, please do consider that. Um, you can you can subscribe to the podcast and you can like us on iTunes. That's always very helpful. Leave some reviews, rate us. Go to geopoliticalfutures.com, browse around, see if you like it or not. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you want. Um, until next time, thanks a lot. Farewell. Auf Wiedersehen. Good night.